Coming up on Digital Music Trends 225 on the 26th of March 2015, a feature on the music mastering platform Lander, and as you'll hear in a second, a lo-fi version of the show, unfortunately, where we discuss Universal Music, Vessel, the YouTube Music Awards, The Orchard, and more. This week's show is brought to you by Gramophone, a small device that can turn your traditional sound system into a Wi-Fi music player. We thank them for the support of Digital Music Trends. Check out the website on gramophone.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Leonelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and apologies but this week we had a bit of a sound disaster on the show uh, as the audio of the recording uh, ended up being corrupted which meant that when I played it back uh, there was a, a ton of digital distortion throughout so uh, I spent a few hours trying to fix it, uh, applying a bunch of different plugins to it and now it is kind of listenable uh, but what I thought I'd do is that I'd include a great interview that I, I did with uh, Justin Evans from the company Mix Genius first uh, so you can experience something that is uh, glitch free and then uh, in the second part of the show there is the actual recording that we did yesterday and you can uh, check it out and see if you can handle uh, the poor sound quality and uh, if, you, if you want to try, uh, try it out that starts at about 26 minutes in. Uh, if you can't deal with it apologies and uh, again I'll see you next week I'm sure we'll have sorted out all the technical problems by then but for now enjoy the interview with Justin Evans and afterwards uh, the uh, glitchy show. It's a real pleasure to be here today with Justin Evans uh, from uh, the company Mix Genius, uh, better known for the product Lander. So hi Justin and thanks for joining me from Montreal. How's it going? Really good. Nice to speak to you. It's great to have you. And so uh, first of all, you just uh, uh, came back from South by Southwest and, and how was your experience there this year? Oh, it was fantastic. It's like uh, one of my favorite years there. I think it was more exciting than ever because the, you know, the last time I was there, we hadn't launched a product yet. And so right. to be there with a product that a lot of people know was a tremendous amount of fun. And so let's talk about the product because uh, I, I suspect that not everybody that's listening to the show knows about you guys. So uh, first of all, uh, tell me a little bit about Mix Genius and then we can delve into what Lander is. Well, actually, they're becoming the same thing, but uh, we're, we're actually losing the Mix Genius name and are going to be right. uh, Lander from now on, which is really exciting. We're just making that change right now. But um, so that's a kind of exciting announcement. I think you got the scoop on that. You're the first that's person awesome. that's, that's heard that. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. But um, basically, the company was formed two years ago, two and a bit ago, uh, out of a research group's work from Queen Mary University of London that we're studying. Um, how things like machine learning and uh, and data analysis could be used to make um, make sound engineering tasks more automated. And so, uh, the original body of research was around mixing and mastering was part that we decided was the most um, e the best place to start commercially, yeah. and especially simply because and and the lander name is is indicative of this. It's it's a lot easier to get a, um, a stereo out file delivered over the internet and to deliver something back for people than to upload a ton of, of stems. And so we thought, wow, here's something we can deliver that really solves a big problem for a lot of musicians. It makes people's lives better for musicians and we can do it really, really quickly and easily and, and deliver a great, great quality for people. Um, so we hit it hard and built the product um, about less than a year ago. Uh, launched in May, launched our um, came out of beta in May of last year. It started taking payments, and we've we're just approaching like we're just shy of a million songs mastered in that time period. So it's been really awesome. exciting. The adoption's been really great. People, we seem to have hit a problem that people really need solved, yeah. and uh, and are really excited about how it's growing. Yeah, absolutely, and and you know, I, f I feel like uh, from the first time I heard about it, uh, when you when you first launched, it, it's really become a, a much better known uh, as a product. And so, in terms of how people re you know re receive the the product and the experience, you know, what have you learned over the past year, and uh, what are the ch are the changes that have happened uh, as part of the the product? Well, it's kind of cool. There's two different answers to that question. One is that the product keeps changing, so um, definitely. Uh, there's two sides to what we've learned, and one is the the feedback that we get from our users, which is incredibly valuable and really awesome. And so, we're actually going to be releasing in the next little while a huge upgrade to the whole website that has um, much more on the experience level requests from our users and things that users have needed and things that users want. And we're really excited about that. We have a really nice. vocal user community. Any of our users out there that are listening. 
thank, that do talk to us, thank you so much. Anybody that uses it, that wants to talk to us, that doesn't, please go to our support. We listen really deeply, and it changes the product all the time, and it's it's fantastic. Um, so on that side, we've we've learned tons about how people. You know, it's a really interesting world. Like people are using using our system for different things. I think one of the most exciting things for me is learning about the way one of the most common kind of objections or whatever or what separates human mastering engineers from us is people saying well we give you you know we give our clients advice and we let clients know what's wrong with their mixes and stuff and finding out that people are actually using lander that way has been really fascinating we have all these users that do the same song 10 15 20 times right and we're finding out what they're doing is using it almost as a a reflection of their mixing skills and then learning how to mix better and kind of continuing remixing their tracks. And so I feel like we've our a tool has unlocked this kind of DIY educational aspect that yeah. we didn't anticipate at all. And that's been really thrilling to see that use case and see people using it that way has been really, really awesome. And obviously um, I would imagine yes, also that that sorry. sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Uh, I was I was also gonna say that I would imagine that given that you continue to ingest more music and you know you have, um, you know millions of tracks that are being mastered, uh, I would imagine that the algorithm also improves w with that sort of process. That's exactly what I was going to say. And so watching the algorithm grow and watching the quality um, shift and and increase and get more nuanced. I mean, I think the thing that's really exciting to me is where Lander's going to be a year from now, another year from now, a year after that. You know, the more more data we get and the more the system can learn, it's and, and the more advanced. You know, we're adapting as as the system gets better. Um, we have a great team of data people here. We have a great team of music DSP engineers, and everybody is working hard to make this thing incredible. And so it's you know the advances we've made in the past year alone are really really exciting. We're going to be releasing some new updates over the next uh, few months. I think our update cycle is going to be quite exciting. Yeah. And uh, just keeping seeing seeing what's in the lab right now. I can't wait to release release it on the world. It's pretty great. Yeah, and I can kind of give the, the, sort of the company gives me a, the, the same feeling that I had around uh, the Equinest in terms that it's it's been put together by sort of people that are on the technical or you know, on the academic side of things uh, but have managed to create a product out of that so that that's quite a sort of exciting angle that we don't see as as often as as an entrepreneurial angle purely yeah and i think the echo nest the echo nest kind of comparison is really interesting because i think in some ways especially what we're doing in terms of how the system listens to music we're doing something uh, akin to Equinest and creating data akin to echo nest is just we're doing it from a purely musical angle and from a like Thinking about questions of like how do songs relate to each other in terms of production styles or production elements as opposed to uh, cultural genre data, you know, I think we're doing something quite unique there, and it's really, it's I, I really look to Equinest. Um, as a real inspirational company for us. Yeah, and I guess, you know, you, you touched upon the fact that one of the uh, things that came up when you first launched was the debate around, uh, you know, live engineers versus machines. And uh, from, from that point onwards, have you found engineers that have sort of turned around and said, actually, you know, this is cool for preliminary stages and we still, we know that we're still valuable for the, the final master. And how's that reaction evolved over the last year? For sure, it's changed radically. You know, like, I, I think that we were, um, I, I, one of the most, scary days of my life was the day we launched the product and like I think 20 minutes after we launched there was an engineers mastering forum where they were just like these guys are horrible I want to kill them and, you know like just this rage against what we were trying to do and it was quite I terrifying um, luckily uh, our we served enough of an audience need of people that I think couldn't probably be served who couldn't afford to be served by those kinds of engineers and, and gave those people a fighting chance at decent mastering that we've survived that initial blast of hate <laughs> And it's really changed. Um, you know, it's really, really changed. The dialogue's completely changed now. And, and we, um, even on some of the most critical forums, there's like moderators saying, oh, yeah, well, yeah, actually, guys, I use Lander. So I think the use case for, um, I think, you know, the use cases for what Lander can do for people is pretty exciting. We have really famous studios, like the, the classic example that we always use, and I'm so grateful for these guys because they're really willing to to talk about it and have been advocates since the beginning is TRI Studios in California, which is Bob Weir's studio. They've been huge, huge supporters of us. We've done hundreds of songs for them. Um, it's awesome. really exciting. People that have huge back catalogs like that, huge live amounts of music, being able to make something happen really quickly, people that need um, increased workflows, people that can't afford professional mastering. And so, you know, 
and even engineers, there's a great, great example of this too, a university in California, in, uh, I, can't remember, I can get Ian's name after the interview, I've, I can't remember his name fully, Ian Varga, I think, and he's using it to teach his students. So the students actually um, do mixes, compare it against Lander, and basically to pass the course, they have to be able to beat Lander, you know, so it's really great. That's great. And I think this is kind of, as we get better, um, I don't think there's a human versus engineer question at all. I think we're going to make um, be a benchmark and and be a great asset for people. We went out to the Ableton was really lovely with us too, and and sent us out to their certified trainers program. We got really great reactions from those people. It was really thrilled to go out because these guys are super qualified, amazing people. Got a lot of interesting feedback from them. It was really well received, and people basically saying, "Yeah, I mean, this is a really really powerful tool for benchmarking. It's a really powerful tool for, you know, if you're in the studio for for hours and hours and hours working, you need a reference check." So even top engineers are starting to really warm to what it can do for them. And, yeah. you know, I think with every engine release we, we create, um, there's more excitement from the professional community as well as from the amateur one. Yeah. And, and also, obviously, you know, it, it saves uh, bands uh, money because uh, ultimately they will end up going to a, a real mastering engineer. But, you know, if they can save themselves from doing three or four trips and being told that this is unworkable or, you know, there's... Sure. Some, I mean, imagine... Hours this like I was funny I was sit, sat in at the mastering uh, conference that happened at South by Southwest on the panel there and they were saying well you know I mean it would be ideal for people to be able to come to a mastering engineer like 10 times for one song but no one I mean that's economically unfeasible and I'm like no it's not we got lander for that you yeah. know like it really lets people audition their mixes and I think that you know um, for many people the ability to uh, have a demo sound yeah pretty close to like fully professionally mastered by what Ladder can do for it. We know it's giving people's record deals. We've heard so much from our fans. We know actually exciting people that are even fully releasing records with Lander at this point. So we're pretty pretty excited about what it's saying about the quality that we're achieving. Yeah. And, and talking about, uh, you know, y you mentioned uh, uh, the fact that uh, well, you have an API program in the prep. And, and so uh, this is an, an important next step because uh, some of the users, that are, the um, listeners of this show, might have used Lander before. So if you go on the site, you can uh, try out the service, you can upload a file, and then you get the sort of mastered version. But on the API side, how does that work and how long has that been active? Uh, I think our first thing went live in, say, maybe late November, early December. And basically, I mean, the API is set up so that Right now, um, if you have a website, so we're, we're really deep in the distribution uh, side of things right now. So distributors like TuneCore, um, on their website, you can basically, as you're uploading your tracks to publish, you can have them hear a mastering preview. And awesome. you know, in the in the audience world of TuneCore, there's tons of musicians that can't <laughs> afford mastering. Yeah. And what's great is you go to publish your song, you can hear the AB, you can hear how much Lander can do for your music before you pay for anything and then you say okay sure I want that and and publish it and, and it's crazy we have a like right now we have a 50% conversion rate on all of the people because it's just so obvious wow. what Lander does for you that it's really like okay cool and this is going to be replicated I, I, I would imagine internationally this is what? right it's going to be replicated internationally I would imagine you, you oh yeah 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 we have 40 partners signed globally already and it's uh, we're just really deep in the process of accelerating the deployments. And the cool thing is that if, you know, for the internationalization side of things, it's not that hard because, you know, you just have to have an upload bin and <laughs> even for yeah. like end users. You know, you know what's <laughs> really hard about the internationalization, which is really funny, is is actually getting the nuances of the language right. Like, right. It's, we, we work so much. I've learned so much about how challenging translation is and, and how complicated it is to explain nuanced audio concepts to people. It's funny, I know this one academic, Brian Pardo, who does all this work about, uh, he's really great, this really interesting work about um, uh, qualifying what people mean when they say things like warm or, uh, or bright or whatever, and he does all this machine learning stuff around this. The, the really hilarious thing is warm in five different languages, oh my god, what a nightmare to try and translate that. So getting into all these, like, you know, there's so much vernacular in the music industry and trying to make, I, I'm nerding out a bit on language, but it's pretty wild. Like that's been no, one of our biggest challenges for uh, for figuring out how to make Lander work internationally. That, that makes sense. I mean, I, I was thinking about the site itself because, you know, the, the actual, you know, upload and then 
you know. Yeah, uh, it's simple. Yeah, it's, it's great. It's simple, right? Yeah, it's but uh, it's the actual explaining to people what you're doing that that becomes a, a lot harder. And on on the front of uh, sort of uh, customizing the 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 output. Uh, um, do you guys have plans of working off genres as well or uh, like can your algorithm pick up essentially genres and it doesn't actually matter what genre the song is in you can you can sort of cater for that already it totally matters what the genre is right. and i think the the thing is this is kind of what i was saying about echo nest before our system is right now doing a pretty um What's live on the site is doing a pretty rudimentary genre analysis and saying this is kind of this area of music or this yeah. is this area of music. This is really the place where the self learning gets really amazing. As we learn more, um, that gets more and more granular and more and more cool. So this is where the big improvements come from one engine release to the next is how dig deep we drill into that. And um, then I think probably, you know, we're looking at offering because the machine learning can generate like kind of nearest neighbor multiple variations of stuff yeah we're looking at offering people say you know um five or six you know up to five or six variations of the master that it generates that's based on that data field and like where it sits in relationship to all that yeah. all the data that we're collecting no, that's great and also like the, the, the challenge with that is that uh, if you start offering personalization based on genre genre is highly personal factor so exactly. as well you could have people that class something as country but actually from an alg algorithm point of view would actually have to be classed as rock so that it, that it, it maximizes the result because there's more guitars for example say but yeah this so, is exactly what i was talking about with the echoness thing like you know the, the interesting thing about country music like think about country and pop right in the past 20 years you know a taylor swift album from the like early stage of her career sounds to me pretty pop music it doesn't sound country per se yeah and from a musical production aspect would be produced as a pop record more than as a you know hank williams record yeah so and and maybe a you know contemporary folk person is going to be produced more like a hank williams record than than it would be like a taylor swift record so the thing for us is we're not trying to understand genre per se and the way that we're thinking about music and that we're thinking about the machine learning, thinking about music is is really different than that. And so genre isn't so much a concern as much as, you know, how can we, you know, the same way a master engineer would pick a reference track, right? Like you're like, oh, you know, you talk with the band, is this what you want to sound like? Is this what you want to sound like? Our system's trying to create that reference area that the music listens, that the music sits in yeah. and, and we'll produce it relative to that. Absolutely. Uh, looking at uh, well, one of the fields that is quite interesting for me as a, as a producer of audio uh, is uh, that of also audio restoration because uh, there's plugins mm. out there that are like thousands of dollars. It's so expensive to get really good audio restoration. Is that yeah. something that you ever looked at? I know it's a very different proposition from what you guys do because it's all based on, of course, musical uh, analysis and understanding how the mastering process will affect the end, 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 end game. But uh, it could potentially be a big market. So I was wondering if you guys ever looked into that. I will very quietly smile in relationship right. to that question. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, moving on, why uh, uh, sort of Montreal? Uh, how, how did that come about? And, and, and uh, are you finding it easy to move people there if you need to have people uh, there? Or do you have teams uh, around the world that, that work on the product? This is a pretty cool story. So um, first, the answering the question about the is it easy to move people here? It's been easy to move people here. I think all of them have particularly hated this winter because we've been the coldest city in the world and had the <laughs> coldest uh, winter on record in the yeah. history of Montreal. So I feel really bad for the people that have moved here this year. But they've done the ground, right? Other than that, it's pretty great. Uh, unbelievably cold this year. It's crazy. So the Brits and, and folks from warmer climates are, are freaking out a little bit right now. So that's funny. But uh, Montreal is a great place to to do this in. And um, I, my own personal story is I've been a musician. I moved in to Montreal in the 90s to be a musician here. And then um, also have had a lot of experience in digital, uh, digital marketing and digital uh, product creation. And there's an, like a really incredible music scene here. So when I co-founded the company, um, I basically took the research from the Queen Mary uh people and brought it back to my music community here and we're really blessed in Montreal we have one of the best indie music scenes in the world of course with bands like Arcade Fire, Godspeed You Black Emperor, you know all these great bands we also have an incredible techno scene like Tiga, 
um, you know, there's there's so much great, great, great music here. Incredible jazz scene, incredible classical music scene, Kent Nagano, you know, like really, it's really one of the world's best music scenes. And it's also an incredibly generous and collaborative music scene. So being able to bring the technology here, our Beautis Records is also incredibly awesome and we're super supportive early on. So being able to bring what we had here and have all these really cool musicians come in and listen and validate it and be like, oh yeah, well actually this is a bigger problem than this and we really need this solved and oh my God, if you could yeah. do this. So we had kind of the most organic and and amazing uh, focus community to really develop the product in and yeah. and I don't think uh, I don't think there could be a better city in the world to make a product like this. And we've been extremely, extremely uh, blessed by the scene here. So it made so much sense to build it here and, sure. um, you know, brought people here. We have deep, deep connections with all the music festivals here. We have deep connections with all the musicians. It's so fun being at South by and like hanging out with the road crew of the Montreal music people that we meet yeah. at every conference, you know, it's really nice. So that's a big part of the reason. That's great. And also I would imagine because there aren't that many music startups, you're not, you know, facing competition or from 20 other startups that are trying to get the attention of bands from various angles obviously not your angle because you're pretty unique but you know if you were in LA or San Francisco there'd be people trying to sell the marketing services and all sorts of other things and, and in Montreal you probably have the feel to yourself and so to a certain extent in terms of the attention that you can you can ask of people even more than that I mean that's a huge part but even more than that we also have an incredible incredible academic uh, world here with Kermit and McGill and right. Concordia's new media program and you know and tons of musicians that are super excited to work on a project like this so you know like HR for us is pretty easy and having incredible conversations with some of the brightest minds in the industry is like calling someone and saying hey you want to go for a beer and talk about this crazy thing that we're doing and, and you know there's just so many incredible people it's a really really fertile environment that's awesome and, yeah. and obviously you know it's a uh it's a service that I think is going to is going to be interesting from various perspectives because obviously you're you're pointing at musicians but as I said there's a lot of interesting applications from all sorts of points of view uh, even live live production and, and all sorts of interesting things that, that that could go into it because uh, I always face the uh, issue of having to fiddle with all my controls here I've got a mixing desk right next to me where I'm, I'm trying to make sure that the levels are okay I still master the recording at the end of the podcast but I try to uh, get the levels roughly right whilst I'm recording and, and make sure there's no major problems because they take ages to fix after I've recorded it. So <laughs> it's definitely. I think we're going to be able to do some miracles for you. I'm pretty <laughs> excited about that. Future roadmap stuff's pretty exciting for that. Excellent, excellent. And well, Justin, uh, finally, just uh, just to, to finish up on on, on South by uh, sort of uh, how how do you see that conference evolving and and. Uh, uh, you know, do, do you think that it can it can stay where it is? We've seen a lot of different opinions uh, this year around uh, whether uh, you know the fact that it was maybe a little bit quieter, but in a good way because it was most focused on, on smaller bands. It was less massive acts going. Do you feel like mm -hmm. it's got the same buzz it had before? And, and are bands excited to go back that have been this year? I feel like it's an interesting question. I feel like my the first few days I was there, um, I was in the. The, the kind of transition from the, the the bridge days. So I spoke on a panel in the day between interactive and music where they overlap. Yeah. It's like Tuesday and, or Wednesday, right? Pardon me? It's Tuesday or Wednesday, I think, that they overlap. Yeah, right? yeah. Tuesday, yeah. Tuesday, and right. So did a, did a speak that day, and it was pretty... Um, I was a little concerned. The interactive was, was great, as it always is. It feels like it's overwhelmed the music a little bit. Um, the first couple of days in the music, I was really, huh, is this, it, it felt quite, um, you know, a little bit, uh, a little bit like the criticisms were, were valid. By the end of the week, you know, it was such an amazing experience. And you, I, I just had met so many incredible people and so much good stuff and, and so many good bands I'd seen that I was like, oh yeah, this thing, maybe this is going to slow down for a couple of years, but yeah. it's still really, really vibrant and really healthy and really alive. And, you know, for me personally, I'm into more marginal music than mainstream music anyway. So I saw stuff that blew my mind and discovered a whole bunch of great new music and was really satisfied by it. So That's it was awesome. a great conference for me.
That's awesome. And also, like to a certain extent, I don't think that you know, if, if we're looking at at the sort of practical uh, point of view of a brand that paid X amount of money for Prince to go and do a gig last year at South by to mm-hmm. probably, probably 400 people, it's like what was the actual return on that? And if they looked at the figures, you know, six months later, and they were trying to figure out what benefits they would get from having Prince go to South by and pay him however much money and and uh, to a very small crowd, or the same for the Pesh Mode or, or or other bands that did the same. And so I guess you know, to a certain extent, there may be a bit of a pullback because they realize that it doesn't make sense to pay millions of dollars to send these big acts when there's already 2,000 bands in town and, yeah. and that's that's a good thing you know I think as, as the more we can focus on those new up and coming bands the better I think one of the other things I really really loved about it this year is the the the, the multiplicity of the experience you know like we were you know, one afternoon we're recording Action Bronson for for some, for a partnership with Crave Online, and then we're then I'm at Moon Duo, like this psych band, and then I'm at the PC Music Showcase, and like just seeing all, all the different cultures of those yeah. different spaces, and being like, wow, these are radically different groups of people, and they're all walking down Sixth Avenue together, and it's yeah. like crazy that that works. You know, it's like really, uh, it's pretty wonderful. It's uh, that was a really great part of the experience. Yeah, it's awesome when it's like hip hop in one venue, and then next door is like uh, metal, and then it's like indie rock, and then folk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of country it's crazy, on the other, crazy, on the side, yeah. and all so different cultures. And then there's this weird blend, and like you walk into a bar and you see some genre of music you'd never pick, and you're totally into it. You know. Yeah. It's really great. And well, uh, Justin, it was such a pleasure having you today. And once again, I would direct people to go and check out Lander, L A N D R dot com. And you can uh, check out the service if you have any uh, music that you never ended up mastering, or if you got some yeah. old demos from your from your old band sitting sitting around. Just just try it out and, and see how see how it sounds. I wanted to uh, start by uh, open by talking and talking about uh, Universal Music. Uh, Universal Music has uh, uh, in over the last few weeks uh, made its uh, shift in attitude towards streaming services quite clear. Uh, you know, it all started when uh, Lucian Grange opened up about his views uh, around uh, free streaming or premium streaming at the Code Media Conference uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, obviously, uh, the, the big turning point was uh, the exit of Rob Wells uh, from the company, uh, which was quite unexpected and, and possibly linked to his support of, uh, of uh, freemium services like Spotify. And uh, uh, the Financial Times just on Friday reported that UMG, uh, whilst renegotiating its licenses with Spotify, may be pushing the service towards modifying its free tier, reintroducing listening caps in order to incentivize heavy users of the service towards paying for it. So uh, this is something that we were expecting, uh, but at the same time, it's still generating a lot of debate around the industry as to whether uh, Universal is doing the right thing and as to whether they're actually making the same mistakes they did uh, you know, 10 years ago in trying to strangle something that is actually seems to be uh, or starting to work. Uh, so uh, first of all, Jen, what are your thoughts on this and, and, and do you feel like, uh, uh, how do you feel about this move from Universal if it is indeed true? These are uh, reports and rumors, of course, we're talking about. I think it follows suit with a kind of an overall trend, I feel like this year at South by Southwest, um, there were a lot of topics that's kind of this, uh, I guess, the calm before the storm. Yeah. And I think we're starting to see not only with Universal Music Group, but also um, with Jay-Z's uh, new company title, just a shift where people are looking to what the future will hold. And while revenues really haven't um I guess, been reestablished in some of the newer models. People are trying to figure out how to reestablish those revenues in the newer models, what shifts need to be made, um, what do we need to look for in the future so that we can bring those about. Um, I think we're at a pretty pivotal point right now where these decisions are critical. And I also see a lot of kind of maybe land grabs from the IP owners for the first time, as opposed to the controlling interests. There's a lot of IP uh, creators that are looking for ways to help monetize their own work, create uh, marketplaces for IP owners. So, yeah. like I said, sort of a, a calm before the storm. I think there's a lot to come in the next um, probably six months. Yeah, uh, Mark, how do you feel about this move by Universal and, and as a you know somebody that has a company that works in this space? Yeah, uh, well, we distributed through Universal, so I think that um, I think their intentions are good, but I think it might be. Um, uh, the time. Uh, I think all these services are in uh, further development, and I think that, uh, you know, it is pushing towards uh, a, a master scenario. I just think it's too early uh, to make those types of decisions on the freemium model right. um, with what Universal uh, wants to do with it. But, but certainly anything that they can do to help promote 
our clients' music. And as somebody that distributes content yourself, how do you feel about the revenues that are coming in from those services right now? Oh, they're terrible. <laughs> they're terrible. <laughs> but is it, uh, is it too early to, uh, uh, to be putting the gun to people's heads? Right. Uh, so to speak, you know. Um, I, I do think the freemium model did work well um, at Spotify just in terms of, of generating new customers. Is it going at the speed that everyone wants it to go? Nope. It's not, and everyone's looking for a fast fix, I believe. Yeah. I said, on, on your side, obviously, you know, we are quite uh, uh, streaming friendly, but, uh, you know, do you think that there is a commercial reason for Universal to do this, this move or this, this shift? Uh, yeah, I definitely see that. I mean, the big thing, everyone out here, so I'm based out in Austria now, um, and it's amazing, everyone out here just uses YouTube. I mean, I'm the only one in, so I only live in a small village, but out of everyone I know in here, I'm the only person that has got a paid subscription to, uh, well, I use Spotify. Right. Um, so there's, if I, I can understand, as Mark was saying, that the, the shift over to premium from the premium versions isn't as quick as people want it to be. Um, and so I can see why Universal would want to do it. But I think it's still just going to leave the people that just don't want to pay uh, using YouTube, and I don't think that's necessarily, don't get me wrong, but I don't think that is at all a good thing, but um, it's, I can see why they would want to do it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I have a 19-year-old daughter, and uh, she won't use Spotify, but she'll certainly go to YouTube and get her little fix for that Coldplay song and, um, you know, anything else that she's listening to. So, um it's a it's a tough call. I think it's, I think all these services are still in development, and, and to pull the trigger on on something this early um, doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, and I guess you know it's it, there's a little bit of uh, of uh, fear uh, just because of the the decline in revenues from Universal, and uh, it was seen like it's, uh, it was a six or seven percent decline in 2014 over 2013. So obviously that uh, is enough to scare any executive, especially if you're looking mm -hmm. at sort of the biggest label in the world. Uh, and, and so in, in that sense, it's understandable. On the other side, uh, yeah, as you say, it's, 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 a very, it's very early to be uh, making these kind of changes. At the same time, I guess, they might be worried that if they don't make those changes now, then they won't be able to make them later once the, the whole thing is sort of become unstoppable. So yeah, a, a, lot of, a lot of interesting insights on that. And also, uh, talking about that, there's a couple of different things. You know, uh, Mark, you talked about YouTube. Uh, we've seen this week uh, the rollout of the YouTube Music Awards, which was a, such a different take on the normal award ceremony. Uh, I don't know if people that are listening or watching have seen the awards yet, but essentially uh, YouTube has put out uh, a list of 50 names that they wanted to highlight uh, out of uh, uh, you know people that have done really well uh, out of YouTube in the last year, uh, uh, musicians. And they've taken 13 of those and, and created a bunch of collaborations and videos and, and spent quite a lot of money actually in producing all these videos uh, and, and mashing them up into a playlist that was hosted by a YouTube star. And, and sort of it's, it's the, the, the antithesis of, of, of a normal award show. It's a playlist on YouTube, and but it still kind of seems to work. Uh, and I had, I had a look at it, and it, it actually it is pretty cool. Uh, I was skeptical about it at best, but uh, but it seems to work. Uh, I said, do you think that this this is a model that can work, or given how so second screening and stuff in, in award shows still is, is an important thing and creates a lot of social media buzz, do, do you think that part will be missed uh, in a format like that, or, or this is the future of, of awards for you? I think it all depends what the aim of the award ceremony is. Right. I, I mean, like, the, the, the problem with any kind of awards is that they are mostly behind doors, right? Yeah. Now, so then you don't have that outside world being able to actually watch, appreciate, look and enjoy. Whereas as soon as it's on YouTube, it's that you don't have those barriers. So I can see it definitely being a, a big plus from that perspective. And then as you said though, from the um, the social media outreach, so to speak, from a, uh, a an award ceremony, because you've got all of the all of the influencers in one room uh, all talking about it, but then it all depends what your aim of the award ceremony is. I would say from the YouTube perspective, doing it just how they've done it is, yeah, I, I can definitely see them just doing that from now onwards. Yeah, it would make sense. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with Sid, actually, but, you know, YouTube is a, it's a world unto its own. You know, it's, gonna, it's in like its own little sphere. And, uh, you know, and another thing is how long will these artists uh, last? 
in in the YouTube sphere because the you know the attention span is just so short um, for any new or, or any new star that comes out on YouTube. Um, as soon as they rise, they're looking for someone else. So yeah. it's a very immediate, fast world. So does it actually mean anything? The awards at YouTube. That's true, and it, it feels also like uh, YouTube is a bit of a training ground at times because even you know the guy that hosts the awards and a bunch of the other YouTube stars are now starting to get TV deals as well. So it kind of it it almost feels like YouTube can also be a training ground for some of the presenters to to do other true. things true. outside of YouTube. Or is it the TV companies trying to capture the new audience? Yeah, that can also be the angle. But they ha and they have more money, so they can actually. Can. I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, they, they, they can put these shows into development immediately, yeah. you know. Sorry, Joe. Oh, so, yeah, I think YouTube is, is doing it the right way. I don't think we need more music awards shows. So I think they're taking the platform that they know best and, and doing something creative with it. And honestly, I'm glad there's not another award show. So <laughs> done in the, the yeah. way that it's normally That's done. That's very true. I guess the only thing, like, it, it was weird that they called it an awards show. I guess it's hard to call it anything else in a way that people can understand what it is. But it wasn't really an award show because they weren't giving out any awards. I guess the the award was the money they gave to the artist to make the videos. I don't I don't know what the right. award was. Right. <laughs> In this case, yeah. another another video on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I didn't see any any statues or any any sort of things changing hands or anything. Right. Like that. One thing that happened this week as well that I wanted to touch touch upon was Vessel. So Vessel is a new uh, video service uh, that. Uh, uh, been launched by the uh, former CEO of Hulu, and uh, uh, essentially it's finally open to everyone. And we've already talked about it on the show uh, a little bit uh, when it launched in, in uh, beta. Uh, and now it's open to everybody, offering both a free and a paid service. Although <coughs> you, if you signed up, I think it's expiring in the next 24 hours or so. But for the last few days, if you signed up uh, to Vessel, uh, you would get a year's worth of subscription for free, at least as far as I understand it, which uh, kind of defeats the point of making any money, but, you know, uh, there you go. Uh, <laughs> we must have a, a good amount of funding to go to offer that. Uh, uh, but essentially, the, the, the site is $2.99 per month if you are on the premium plan, and it will allow you to access a bunch of early, uh, you know, ver ver early access to videos. Uh, uh, this uh, in partnership with a bunch of different channels. Uh, Universal uh, Music has done a, a partnership with uh, Vessel already, so we're going to have to see whether they are actually going to uh, release some of the bigger videos, like you know, so somebody like you know Nicki Minaj or Ariana Grande uh, on on the service first, because uh, that could be a big driver of, of people actually signing up and and being willing to pay uh, that little bit uh, of money per month to access that that content. But they also have hundreds of channels from all sorts of different places, uh, including YouTubers and, and vloggers, but also Time Magazine and BuzzFeed and TED. They, they all have their own. Uh, uh, feed on on Vessel is kind of an aggregator of video, really, to a certain extent. And so, uh, you know, the, the, uh, Sid, do you think users will buy it, uh, to a service like that at that price point? Uh, it doesn't make sense. Uh, I'm honestly kind of on the fence. I mean, I, I'm hoping it's going to work, but I, so I, I love the idea of sites like Patreon. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think that the the problem we have at the moment with online is that it's really hard to take any money yeah. from people. I mean, it's not just in the content space. There's any kind of thing to do with uh, online and the internet is not easy. Yeah. So um, I, it will be interesting to see if it does. I mean, they've, they've obviously got a, uh, quite a lot of investment behind them. Yeah. Um, so if, if they've got a chance, then it certainly uh, would be good for everybody else. Um, whether or not it will... Depends if the, the content makers take off their content from the free sources, right? Yeah. I mean, there, there's the whole paywall for news sites, which has been going on for a long time. And has that made me pay for uh, the Financial Times? No, because most of the time the content will be posted somewhere else later. Yeah. Um, so so it's a the problem. Yeah. I mean, that's it, right? So I, I like the idea of tip jars. Um, so having like a, a tip jar where you, oh, has Mark gone? Oh, I tried. Go ahead. Uh, ha having a tip jar so people can give the money if they want to. Um, I, I like those ideas. They don't necessarily work that well. But then you look at things like from a uh, Candy Crush perspective. So Candy yeah. Crush, like they have the term called whales. So it's something like 99% of their players don't give them any money. But then the 1% of their players that do give them money give them a lot of money. 
Right. I mean, they were making millions. Like, I don't know exactly what it was, but it was like at least millions a month. It was probably uh, actually over a shorter period of time from 1% of the people that were playing the game. Yeah. But then again, the ceiling that you have is $3 a month. So you're not going to be able to have sure. people that pay $100. And so Through Vessel, you can't. No, no exactly. So that, that, that's kind of a problem. So, uh, Jana, on your side, do you think that this could, could uh, take off, you know, 72 hours to a week worth of preview? <laughs> so I think they're doing some things right. Uh, their site looks great. Yeah. I think the delivery, the cleanliness of the site, um, that's a big bonus. A lot of people are tired of the clutter. So, you know, they're, they're playing their cards right, let's say. But again, back to oh, the theme of, you know, what they're trying to do, and I applaud them for it, is get artists paid. Yeah. And if somebody doesn't take that chance, then we're never going to know. So back to the universal thing um, and Spotify, if people don't start creating models that do compensate the artists and the creators and all parties um, at higher rates, then we will never ever know if those models will work. So I'm I'm rooting for Vessel. I hope it goes well. Yeah. Again, I think they've um, looked at some of the areas that are highly critiqued and they've addressed those flaws with their model. And yeah. now it's, will people actually pay for um, brain candy? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and Jenny, you also have, we talked about last week uh, uh, briefly about uh, the Orchard and sort of an, an interesting uh, uh, development there in that uh, Sony Music has uh, uh, become the sole owner of the Orchard, which is uh, uh, possibly <coughs> the largest uh, independent uh, distributor of independent uh, labels uh, uh, in, in the world. And uh, uh, that was for $200 million, uh, supposedly uh, for a 49% stake, because they already had a slight majority stake in, in, in the company. Uh, and that was uh, bought from a dimension which owned uh, the, the, the minority stake. Uh, uh, people are wondering whether that means anything uh, for the orchard, whether the orchard has uh, uh, done, uh, you know, whether this will, will change anything at the company. Uh, uh, the, the feeling is that it won't, but you never know. What, what do you think? I think it depends on what they want. I mean, if you know, if they're really wanting to keep it in the spirit of independent music, independent distribution, then they should leave it alone, right? Um, yeah. And just uh, kind of give it some some uh, muscle, I guess, but let it do its thing. I, I don't know if huge entities are really great at doing that, though. So, I, I mean, I'm I'm kind of waiting. Uh, yeah, um, I don't know. It's, it's it's kind of a it's kind of an odd one. Uh, Sid, uh, on your end, uh, obviously it's not really your field uh, as far as uh, uh, distributors and stuff. But but obviously you're an observer of this industry. Do do you think that uh, uh, a major getting hold of a distributor like that will, will change the dynamics in, in any way? Uh, I kind of was totally agreeing with what Jen was saying. Um, it will be a case of waiting and seeing. But, I mean, they it's but they're specialising in indie. Are they going to stay as an indie or not as an indie, obviously, but are they staying in that field? Um, the only way to tell that is wait and see. I've seen so many companies being gobbled up by bigger companies yeah. and then and them saying, oh, it's all right, we're not going to change, nothing's going to be different. Yeah. Um, and then as we all know, give it three months and then it all changes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's just a case of wait and see. Yeah. I, uh, if, it, if it was my gut instinct, I think there will be some changes, um, but that's purely from a gut instinct perspective. Yeah, yeah. And I wonder if any of this has to do with their, um, I guess, just uh, viability in the in the, their own distribution, yeah. because the majors currently rely on external third party platforms to distribute their content. So, I mean, there's got to be some of that as well. Yeah. No, that's that's right, and uh, and you know we're going to keep an eye on it and see and see what happens there. But uh, you know the the feeling is that not much is going to change at least in the short term. But then you never know. It, it's so it means that it is owned by a different company, and so they could do essentially whatever they want with it uh, at the same time. And uh, and talking about ambitious uh, plans uh, that have nothing to do with major labels, uh, well, I wanted to uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, Jay Z. So Jay Z has uh, acquired. Uh, uh, 
uh, the company uh, Aspiro, and uh, that, that, that transaction has gone through finally. Uh, the interesting tidbit of information that came up uh, last week, I mean, we keep getting loads of news around this. So it's kind of like a never-ending news cycle on Tidal at the moment. But uh, the big thing that came up is the fact that uh, Showbiz 411 uh, reported that uh, Jay-Z gathered a who's who of, of popular music stars at the Grammys to discuss his plans uh, for the service before he actually made the move for their position. And he got a bunch of people, including Madonna, Kanye West, the Daft Punk, uh, Nicki Minaj, Chris Martin, Jack White, Beyonce, and Rihanna, uh, all in the room to sort of discuss uh, whether they could do uh, sort of like a, a replica to a certain extent. They, they, they make a comparison with the uh, United Artists pictures in 1919, uh, where uh, some of the art actors decided to take the, some of the power away from the, from the studios and create their own. Uh, it's a very ambitious plan. I, I wonder if, if it can work, uh, if it can work at that price point. Obviously, uh, reminding the audience that title is right now in the U.S. is only available in the high definition version, which is uh, $20 a month. Uh, and, uh, and so it, a lot of issues there, and also whether perhaps a title will launch a, a normal service, uh, a Spotify, a direct competitor to Spotify, uh, that is not uh, $20 a month. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Sid, do you think that uh, this could work? Uh, As Jen was saying sense? earlier, I mean, it, it, like the IP holders are slowly um, trying to work out ways to distribute their own IP. Right. Um, I mean, that's that's got to be a good thing for them. With regards to will it work, you would you would hope so. With the names attached, you would hope that they would be able to do pretty well with it. Um, I mean, but then we only have to think of Justin Timberlake and MySpace as to the names doesn't necessarily make it a hit. Yeah. Um, then there's a part of me that's thinking, do we need yet another streaming service just to dilute the pool even more? Um, so I'm totally, I, I, I've got conflicting thoughts about this and yeah. about whether or not it will work and whether or not it's even a good thing. Um, but I, I think it will work. Um, yeah, I reckon it will. It, the, the price point is, the, it, I think it's good to have a higher price point. I mean, it does differentiate yourself, right? And then there are people who are more than happy to pay more. Yeah, and, um, and your, then your profit margin skyrockets. Sure, and then you're going to have like you're you're going to have a lower price point with things like feet. I mean, when Apple do whatever it is they're going to do with it, um, they I think they will capture the the lower market, the lower end. Um, but then the for the those who want crystal clear audio, yeah. who want um, they, I mean they'll pay more for it. So I think there's no issue with it being a higher price point. Yeah, with that kind of. Um, marketing push behind it. Jen, do you think that, I mean, there's a lot of problems that I still was saying, and also the other issue is that a lot of the artists that I mentioned, even if they wanted to do this, they're all tied to record deals. So it's not like they can say, oh, we're going to pull the plug from other streaming services and just go with Tidal because the labels are not going to be happy about that, that they're signed with. The metrics make sense. And again, yeah. it's it's the same kind of thing as Vessel. Um, it's, it's testing the waters to see where where the um, listeners and the customers are gonna go, I can see it being a lot more niche. And again, I think if title differentiates itself by adding very key, very desirable features, then I think they can do well with it because even if it's niche, at that metric at $19.99 a month, I mean, that can be substantially more than what any other artist might be making on another platform. Yeah. So it's, Again, I mean, I applaud the services that are really out there trying to bring more back to the creators because we have set a trend in digital, which is free content. Yeah. And I think it's time to uh, make a shift in order to create sustainable careers for the creators of intellectual property. And, and I guess that the big question mark is who is going to have the clout to have Beyonce on the first day of release, Taylor Swift on the first day of release. Is, is there anybody that can do that? Is, is that Apple, possibly? And so, I think it's going to be, uh, some of that's going to be twisting arms, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it still comes down to power. <laughs> but uh, but I, I, I really love to see diversity and models that are challenging existing models. Yeah. And, and even now, like as much as iTunes is declining in its, in its prominence, uh, how many people are sharing the link for the Prodigy, uh, like free stream? the week before release. Everybody's talking about it, even though it's only available uh, as a stream on iTunes. Which... I haven't seen that many people talk about it. Really? Yeah, I've only seen a couple. Right. So maybe it's 
it's not that good anymore. Different circles. <laughs> Different circles. For sure. Interesting. So one thing, however, that I've noticed a few people chatting about is a different model that no one's doing, which is, so let's take Spotify. So you're paying $10 a month for Spotify or however much it is you're paying. That if you listen to two songs, your money isn't just going to those two artists. Your money is still being split across all of the plays for what everyone else is listening to. Yeah. So what if your subscription fee was actually, so if I listen to 10,000 songs in a month um, and I pay $10, so a thousand of a dollar, so 0 0.001 uh, goes to each of those listens. But then if I only listen to two songs that month, so that $10 gets split to the two listens. I think it would be a really interesting uh, experiment that as a model because then you would um, start to see more money going into the pockets of the indie, right? Because sure. you get a lot of people that don't listen to um, the, the more commercial music where the money it would be more diluted. Yeah, and that, that was actually interesting because that was a study that was made and was commissioned by Tidal or by WIMP. To a certain okay. Extent. Interesting. Uh, it was uh, it was done by a, a, a bunch of uh, PhD students. Uh, I can't remember the university exactly, but it was somewhere in the Nordics. Uh, and and the, uh, I talked with one of the guys from WIMP two years ago about that study. Uh, or was it last year? Uh, time goes by so quickly. Uh, but it, it, essentially, the, the idea would, would be that that 70% wouldn't be distributed as it is today, uh, proportionally to to the deals and the size of the label. So, but literally, like your own subscription, if I pay 10, 10 pounds a month seven pounds of those ten pounds would go only to the artists that I'm listening to mm. uh, and would be distributed evenly, evenly sort of proportionally amongst those artists, which would be a big shift uh, for for the whole market. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, that all, time, right? Sure. And it all depends on uh, on analytics and yeah. stats and uh, the logistics of it obviously will probably add extra time and cost to it all. But um I think that would be an interesting model if that was tried by somebody. Yeah. Jan, do you think that that could be feasible if, if you listen to uh, one artist for the whole month of the whole $7 from your subscription that's supposed to go to a label goes to the artist? That's the kind of technology that we're uh, working on. <laughs> <laughs> so is it feasible? Yeah. I mean, it, it's funny. My CTO always looks at me and says, Jen, don't worry about the tech side. I got that. Anything is possible. And it is. So it's all about yeah. politics at that point. Yeah, yeah. And the politics is going to be a hard conversation to have because uh, <laughs> given the amount of money that the labels are making and Spotify promising to pay Universal a billion uh, over the next uh, two years, uh, then uh, according to that report at least, uh, then we're talking big money. And so with big money comes big politics and, uh, and all that comes with it. Uh, but uh, yeah, given the amount of money Universal is making, I, I doubt that they're going to bar the road of Spotify too much, especially as they own part part of the company, but uh, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that strong arming goes, especially now that Rob Wells, who's, who's probably the best friend of the company uh, at Universal, uh, uh, is gone. Um, but yeah, I think for this week, uh, it was pretty much that. Uh, we uh, covered pretty much everything. I think, yes, yeah, that's great. And uh, uh, once again, I would encourage people to go and check out the uh, Marion site, uh, uh, marion.fr slash advent. Now, I would also encourage people to go and check out uh, wemakeawesome.it uh, for the site of, of uh, Sid's company and also audiosocket.com uh, for uh, Dan's company. And thank you so much for uh, And once again, thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic week and until uh, next time.